awesome. I love that you're sharing with each other. Today, we're going to talk about safeguarding your mission, understanding common security threats, and how to protect your nonprofit against them. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here. I'm so glad you're here. This is being recorded, so you are going to get the slides and the replay. For those of you here, I'm sure we're all familiar with the platform now. Put your questions in the chat or feel free to put them in the Q&A. If you need the closed caption, go ahead and tap on that CC button. I know somebody's already done that. There's going to be a survey that's going to pop up as soon as you leave. Some of you have to leave early or when we end. It's just two questions. We would love to know your thoughts on the survey, excuse me, the, the um, information today, and then your ideas on future topics. So I'm going to move out of the way and turn this over to our speaker today. Her name is Angela Tai Sai, right? I, I had it earlier and then I still mess it up. She's going to tell you more about herself. Angela, thank you so much for being here today. Over to you. Thank you, Aretha. Um, let me get my screen up real quick. All right. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're calling in from. My name is Angela Tsai. I am a nonprofit solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. So what, if you haven't heard of solutions architect, my role in my day-to-day -day job is to work with nonprofit organizations such as yourself, understand their mission, what it is that they are trying to accomplish, and see how with AWS's cloud technology, we can help you accelerate and advance your mission. And in that work, right, in my day-to-day -day conversation with my customers, one of the top topics that I hear from my customer is around security. And so that's why I thought, of that, thought about the session today. And so hopefully by the end of the webinar today, you will walk away with concrete tips and best practices that we have put out for our customers so that you can apply it to your organization and your application whether you are hosted in the cloud or not. Um, as Aretha mentioned, there is a chat and a Q&A functionality with Zoom. I do have my colleague, Mike Yoon, with me today, who will be monitoring the chat as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in there. So let's go ahead and get started. So, this is the rough agenda for today. I will start by discussing some of the common threats that we hear and see um, from operating our solution, as well as what I hear from customers, then talk about best practices that we suggest for our customers, some of the security best practice areas, how we think about them. Then at the end, I will share with you some of the security tools that we offer for our customers who are in the cloud today, um, so that you are aware if you are cloud curious, who is um, evaluating AWS, you know what is available to you. I will also do a quick demo of those set tools and end with some resources on how you can get started as well as security resources that you can take back to your team. So as I was preparing for the session today, I came across this quote that I thought was extremely fitting. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Now, while there is a debate on the internet whether Benjamin Franklin actually said this quote or not, because there's no evidence that he said it, even though most of internet credits this quote to him, uh, there's no debate on the wisdom of this phrase, right? When it comes to security of the data that your organization has, let it be your member information, your donor information, or if you're providing services, the recipient's information, you need to take a proactive approach in protecting those data. A lack of preparedness may leave you vulnerable to threats. Well, if you were here, then I want to give you a round of applause and kudos to you because you are already taking the first step to being proactive and learning what is out there. So on that note, before we go any further, I want to hear from you why you are here. So go ahead and open the chat and put in the chat, what are some security concerns you may have? Why are you here today? Are there specific threats that you're concerned about or you're here just to learn a little bit more about what you can do? Um, are you 
protecting your resources by yourself today on premises, or are you trying to learn how you can do that with the cloud? Let me know. So I see Alex has some general security concerns. Okay. Anyone else would like to chime in? Okay, I see some security breaches, so we want to understand how to improve. Learning how you can protect yourself, yeah. Educational purposes to see what else you can do better and what you can improve, I like that. Uh, email protection, ransomware what you should pay attention to, general security. Okay, well, I really appreciate you all who uh, participated. So it sounds like we have um, personal concerns, phishing emails, um, email protection, how you can better protect yourself, and also some uh, general security concern for your organization and want to learn more about what is out there, how you can protect them, and what are some things you should think about doing if you're not doing today. All right, thank you all so much. So with that, um, let's jump right in. A lot of you mentioned you want to learn about what's out there. So in 2022, we did an analysis on the log data that we have. So um, the, the services that we have public endpoints to, the log data that's coming in, we did an analysis to see what are some of the most common attacks that are attempted on our infrastructure and applications. And here's what we found. So first is the distributive denial of service, or you may hear it, someone, some people refer it to as DDoS for short. So what is DDoS? DDoS is when the bad actors try to flood your websites or your application with requests and traffic so that your application gets so busy and so flooded with the request, the illegitimate request that your actual users um, cannot come through because your website is now super slow or it has completely been taken down. Why would they do that? Well, specific concern for nonprofit is if your organization, let's say you have recently increased your media attention, or there has been a spike in the online activities or donations or volunteer registrations, and your mission area may be struck an emotional core with a bad actor, and they want to undermine the trust that your organization may have with your end user, that's something that they might do to take down your website or slow down your website so that you can't take donation or your donors and members cannot access it. The next common thread that we saw were web exploits. Basically what web exploits are, are when uh, bad actors actively look for vulnerability within your applications, your systems, your servers, um, to see if there's a way for them to get into your system. Now, why would they do that? Well, if they succeed in getting into your system, they could steal your data. They could install malware to perform further attacks, which leads to the next one, which is botnet. So botnet is when a network of computers has been infected by malware and they are being used to perform attacks without the rightful owners of those servers, computers without realizing. So an example of this is someone mentioned phishing email or have you ever had the experience of getting an email or text message or maybe a social media direct message from your friends, but they don't sound like they're coming from your friends. Um, it's because someone has gone into their resource and used their resource to perform further attacks and the rifle owner doesn't know that. So these are the top common threads that we saw based on analysis. But one more I wanted to mention, which is one I hear so often from my nonprofit customers and someone mentioned it in the chat earlier as well, and that is ransomware. So what is ransomware? Ransomware is when the bad actors uses the system vulnerability, they get into your system and they access your data. Now, what they're going to do is they're going to take a key, an encryption key that you don't have, and they're going to encrypt that data so that even though you still remain access to your data, you can no longer read them. They're not useful to you. So why would they do that? Well, depending on the data involved, the unauthorized user may threaten to reveal the data 
And that could result in fines for you if you are have data privacy laws that compliances that you're following, or it could undermine again your the trust of your organization that you may have built with your end users. So if we know that these threats are, are there, ransomware, DDoS attacks, web exploit vulnerability, why don't we just make our system not vulnerable and protect against them? Well, it's not as simple as that, right? From my nonprofit customers that I talk to, here are some of the top security challenges that I hear from them. First is the reliance on sensitive data to gain insight. So as a nonprofit organization, you want to expand your reach, right? To make sure that your mission area has reached as many people as possible and you've garnered as much support as you can. But as you can. But to do that, you have to analyze the data you may have on your existing donors. What type of donors tend to um, be more open to what you are trying to accomplish, right? But that means you're collecting data on your donors and that can be health data. Maybe you're collecting credit card information if you're taking donations. Maybe you're taking their street addresses, their phone numbers, et cetera. You rely on people's uh, personal information to gain insights, which means you have more responsibility to protect that data. But with nonprofit organizations, we are often stretched thin. You are operating on a skeleton crew. Maybe you only have one or two IT teams who's already you know, stretched thin on what they have to do. They don't have time to dedicate to uh, specific security processes. And on top of that, budgets and resources are constrained and often they're prioritized for things that may have direct impact for your mission or directly benefit your recipients um, who receive benefits from your organization. Last but not least, with the nonprofit organization, right? Like I mentioned earlier, some of you might be collecting health information, some of you might be collecting personal information, and some of you might have data that's sitting in Google Analytics that's collecting web information, or you may have your different donor CRMs that you are collecting data. Data is everywhere. There's no one size fit all because everyone is using different things. So how can we solve security challenges and then knowing the threats, what can we do? How do we know with all these different things that you've locked your doors tight enough? So over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, I want to share with you how AWS thinks about security and hopefully it provides you a starting ground on how you can start protecting and thinking about protecting against these threats. So how we think about security. First and foremost, we say security is job zero. It is the top priority. This stems from our obsession with our customer. We want to make sure you don't suffer the negative impact of your business. And so in your terms, you want to make sure that you're protecting the data of your end user, your members, your donors, and making sure that they don't lose their data or get exploited by the uh, bad actors. Next, we think that security should be everyone's responsibility, not just the security teams. Now, this doesn't mean that the entire organization is going to sit down with the security team and figure out what to do with a firewall, because a lot of us probably can't do that. But what that means is that security, everyone should be in charge of security at their job level, at their domain. So for example, as an employee or as a member of an organization, you want to make sure you're setting a strong password, that your password is not ABCD1234, right? Or where possible, implement multi-factor authentication, um, locking laptops when you step away. If you're looking at donor information um, at a cafe, making sure you close your laptop when you walk away. Simple things like that, right? Establishing security as a culture within the team where it is everyone's responsibility. Next um, is that security should be guardrails, not gates. Often people think of the security team as gatekeepers who block deploy, uh, development and hinder agility, saying no to everything, right? But we believe that the security team should aim to set up guardrails. And there's two reasons. One is that it is more effective to have good habits and guardrails than it is to have uh, very strict 
little nose everywhere. So think about your old Looney Tune or Tom and Jerry cartoon, right? Remember those scenes where, let's say, a tub is about to overflow and you can imagine Tom is putting his finger on one hole and his other thumb on the other hole and he may be using his foot, but then eventually the thing still overflows, right? So covering things here and there is not enough. You want to set up a good guardrail, a good security foundation so that you protect against these threats from the get-go. And last is that security is a journey. It is not something you set and say, okay, we're done. It is something that you want to continue to continue to go back and revisit, iterate, and gradual improvement. So earlier, someone in the chat mentioned that they may have experienced a couple of breaches. So security is a journey, right? Now you have those uh, breaches, you may have those uh, incidents that happen, let's evaluate and see what we can do better. So it is a continuous journey, it will never be done. So that's why all the reasons I mentioned just now, we created the well-architected framework to keep all those things in mind. So the well-architected framework is a set of design principles and thought-provoking questions, thought exercise questions, that we've developed for our customers to force you to think uh, proactively in the design of your workflow. It forces you to weigh the consequences and consider the potential failures or risks before they take place. The wall architecture framework has six different pillars. First is operation excellence, then we have security, reliability, performance efficiency, cost optimization, and sustainability. Like I mentioned earlier, the key is to have good security guardrails. Creating a technology solution is a lot like constructing a physical building. If the foundation is not solid, it may cause structural problems that undermine the integrity and the function of the building. Same thing with your application. So while we're going to focus on security today, I encourage you after the session today, go and take a look at some of the other pillars to see how those design principles and exercise questions may help your organization as well. Well, let's talk about security because that's why we're here. So let's start with the security design principles. So here, the design principles, these are overarching best practices that in order to operate your workload securely, you should keep them at the back of your mind always. First, implementing a strong identity foundation. So this means implementing principle least privilege, only giving user access to what they absolutely need access to and nothing more, and enforcing the separations of duty to make sure that you're um, really enforcing that principle of least privilege. Next is maintain traceability. This is talking about the monitoring, alerting, and auditing of actions and changes that are happening to your environment. Do you have a way to track that? If someone were to get in and make changes to your environment, do you know who did it? And that way, if something were to happen, can you go back and say and see um, where the changes came from and who performed the changes? That way, in case there is a lead credential, we know exactly where the lead credential is coming from. Applying security at all levels. So this goes back to security happens for all the teams, um, but also security at all levels in terms of all of your applications, right? This is your email, this is your laptops, this is your application. If you have on-premises workloads, this is your networking, your data center, your physical data center itself, the physical server itself, right? All the different layers that relate to your organization making sure we're thinking about security at all those levels. And automating security best practices. This is a theme that will come up a lot um, in the next couple of minutes um, in, in the session today, automating security best practices. We as human, we make errors. So what we encourage our customers to do and think about is wherever possible, apply automation so that we take the human out of the picture provide less room for errors, and then less room for areas of attack. Protecting your data both in transit and at rest. So classifying your data into their relative sensitivity level, and then use methods such as encryption, access control where appropriate to protect your data, but think about them both in transit 
and a risk where you're storing them today. Um, keeping people away from the data, which goes back to the automating security best practices, using mechanism and tools to eliminate uh, manual access, and then last but not least, preparing for security events. So think about if something were to happen, how would you bring the data back? If you someone accidentally delete the data or a bad actor gets in and wipe your data clean, is there a way to bring that data back? If you were to encounter let's say um, a ransomware attack, right? Is there a way to bring your data back? So on and so forth. So what are you doing to prepare for in case something were to happen? So these are design principles, but what does that look like in practice, um, in, in action? So here are some examples of what that can look like. So earlier um, I mentioned about identity and principle least privilege. So that may mean separating your workloads and your users. So if you have a production environment versus a development environment, does everybody need access to the production environment? Probably not, right? So granting most of your developers to the development environment and only a handful to the production environment as needed. Or maybe it is if you're storing um, files, pictures, donor data in cloud storage, in some sort of cloud drive, Google Drive, et cetera, file shares. Um, does everyone need access to this specific folder where we're storing donors' information or where we're storing past fundraising information? Or can we separate that somehow to only the right people have access to the data? Um, next is identifying validating controls. So you may have different compliance requirement and within the data that you hold, there's different levels of prioritization and classification, right? Donors, credit card information is very important. Um, so is your donors maybe name, right? But the credit card information might need to be a little bit more secure than the other, so on and so forth. And so identifying and knowing what you're protecting and applying the right level of control accordingly. And then keeping up to date with security threats and recommendation, which is what all of you are doing right now. The technology is changing very rapidly, and that means also security threats and what is out there. So making sure you're staying up to date on the recommendation, what is up and coming, things like that, so you know how to protect yourself against them. Um, automating testing, so automation. Um, if you have code that you're deploying, do you have tests that you can do to automate the test, uh, tests that you can do to uh, check the codes before you release them, right? So for example, um, does your code contain sensitive information? Did you accidentally hard code and put your credential information, your password or your access key within your code um, before you push them and release them to the public? So do you have tests that check for those things before you release them? Um, and then last but not least, threat modeling. So again, staying up to date on what is what threats are out there and then thinking ahead in that incident response on how you can protect against them and evaluate whether you have the right control in place to protect against them. So that is the design principle. That is kind of the overarching best practice that we want you to keep in mind at all times. Now let's drill it down a little bit more. Within security, there are five different areas that uh, we separate things into. Identity and access management, detection, infrastructure protection, data protection, incident response. I already talked about each of these at a high level, so I want to drill down on some of these a little bit more so you get a little, uh, couple more tips and things to think about um, for each of these areas. So identity and access management, this is controlling access to resources, who can access it, what can they access, and how can they access it. Some of the questions we encourage you to think about in this area is, how do you manage the identity for your people and machines today? And how do you manage the permission for your people and your machine? So as far as identity goes, that is referring to are the people that are logging in who they say they are, right? Am I logging in as Angela or someone stole my credential and is pretending to be Angela? So to prevent that from happening, using strong sign-in mechanism. So that is using a strong password, requiring 
um, special characters, right? Um, or this is multi-factor authentication. So when you're logging into your bank, you are probably asked to enter a special and enter a one-time password that's texted to your phone, right? Wherever possible, whatever applications you're using, if that is an option, go ahead and enable it. Next is think about your temporary credentials. So some of you might have partners who come in to help you implement a solution or auditors who are coming in to take a look at your environment. Those are not your long-term employees. They don't need long-term credentials. So think about your temporary users. Are you making sure that you revoke them once the contract has ended, once the auditing has completed? Or are you letting them sit there, right? Because if we're, you're letting them sit there, then that's an additional area of uh, attack that you were, uh, the bad actors may have or gain access to. Storing secrets securely. So this means your database passwords, your API access keys. Do you have a way to store them securely? And also, do you have a centralized identity provider for your employee? So some of the ones I hear often from the customers I work with are um, Active Directory, Google Workspaces, et cetera. So a lot of the software vendors out there today allows you to integrate the your identity provider with their software and application. So wherever that possible, go ahead and do that, right? Because um, the old IT belief used to be rotate password a lot, create new password everywhere so that if one password is compromised, it doesn't affect your other application. But what people have found out is that when you're asking someone to remember 20 different passwords, they're not going to remember. I know for myself, I rely very heavily on my smartphone's capability to remember my, remember my passwords for me because I don't know any of them. Um, so having a centralized provider um, allows your user to make one really good password and remember that and then use that throughout the different things they're interacting with. But that's not to say you shouldn't still audit, um, audit and rotate those credentials periodically wherever it makes sense. Also for your database passwords, et cetera. And then leverage user groups and attributes. So group user based on function, right? So the example I gave earlier, file shares, do you have a group of people that um, has certain level of security permissions that you want to assign to them? If so, then group them together, assign permission accordingly. Because if there's less things for you to manage and you're able to manage people in groups, you're more likely to be secure because you're more likely to be diligent about the three groups that you're managing as opposed to the 30 people permission you're managing. Then let's talk about our permission. Um, so some of these we touched on already, granting principal these privilege, uh, and then reducing permissions continuously. So a lot of the applications out there today will give you a little metric saying, Angela last locked in on the state. Right. So if those metrics are available to you, take a look at them. Do, does a user really need access to a tool or access to a folder if they really haven't opened it in the last hundred days? Right. Um, evaluate the permission and trim it down as necessary. And manage access based on life cycle. So have a way to, um, if you have employees who's left an organization, contractors who's left, to revoke those access and now making sure you're keeping those at the top of your mind. And being aware and knowing what the public has access to. So you are sharing data with your members and with the public, right? But once you put out on the internet, there's no coming back. You can take it down, but if someone has already downloaded it, taken the screenshot of it, it is out now, now out there. So be very mindful of what information public has access to. And that kind of goes back to the data classification we we're talking about earlier. Um, when you know the data is public, you apply the right level of security and then making sure only the right data is out there. And same thing with within the organization, making sure you're sharing resources security within the organization as well as with your third party um, partners that you may be working with. So then, that, next, let's talk about detection. So that's about capturing events, analyzing logs to identify events, and then taking actions. And the question you should be thinking about here is, how are you detecting and investigating security events? So some of the things that can happen here 
is if there's logging capability in the applications you're using, go ahead and turn them on, right? So that you know what is happening. But on top of collecting the log, you have to have a search tool that allows you to discover potential events of interest. That is crucial in finding unauthorized activities or unintentional changes. So we live in the information age today, right? The volume of logs that we are collecting, if some of you might be collecting web analytics from Google, so you might know the data that's coming in today through the different sources, it can be overwhelming. So on top of collecting and having a way to search, um, what a good detection system looks like is the ability to automatically detect um, events, right? To be able to have the machine sift out all the noise and present to you, hey, this one looks abnormal. I think you should take a look. And there are a lot of third-party tools out there that allows you to stream all your different logs into their tool and then they will help you analyze that and then bring the um, events of interest to your attention. And lastly is implement actionable security events. So once you get the alert, what are you going to do? And that's what are you going to do is not something we want to talk about first time when it happens, right? That's something we want to think ahead of time. Next, we have infrastructure protection. So this is uh, where you define your organization obligations, whether it is data policies you have to abide by or compliance models and identify the next necessary access for workload to function and prevent all unnecessary access to resources. So some of the questions you should be thinking about here is how are you protecting your network resources and how are you protecting your compute resources? Now, what does that look like? Well, it can be creating network layers and control traffic at all layers. So what I mean by that is grouping your resources based on access needs. So it's similar to how we group people, right? And apply permission on top of the people. Same thing with your resources. If you're hosting on premises or if you're in the cloud today, grouping your resources based on access needs, and then you apply the firewalls and traffic controls accordingly. So for example, if you have a database, that has your donor's information that is used internally for reporting, then put that with resource, other resources that don't need access to the internet, maybe, right? If you're only doing internal traffic there and then separate it from applications that does need a public access, maybe your web application, things like that. And automate network protection. Again, the word automation, because again, we want to eliminate human, uh, manual interjection to prevent human errors and also having that automation will help you sift out the noise. So for example, does your website have an application firewall today that has automatic intrusion detection or prevention tools that can help you adapt to the current threat uh, landscape and reducing their impact? And again, that's, some, uh, that's a tool that uh, a lot of, there are a lot of third party options out there as well. And in a demo, I will also share with you one option that we have at AWS uh, for the web application firewall. And last but not least, implement inspection and protection um, at each layer. So there's public traffic to your website, there's internal traffic to your database, making sure you're inspecting traffic at all levels, maybe collecting logs, right? Like we said earlier um, about the uh, detection, at every layer so that you know what is happening, both public facing as well as internal facing to catch bad actors who may have infiltrated your system. So now let's talk about compute resources. So compute resources, you wanna make sure that you're performing vulnerability management, um, scanning and patches in your code, your infrastructure to protect against new threats, and also review your resources and reduce unused components, right? Something that I hear a lot from my uh, nonprofit customers sometimes when I'm going through this exercise with them is I would ask them, well, this thing is being flagged as not exactly secure. What is this? They're like, well, you know, I think that was something we experimented with about five years ago, but we don't need it anymore. If you have things like that, right, go ahead and delete them. Again, we want to reduce the potential uh, threat areas, threat um that, that bad actors could get into. So if you don't need it, it's not used, turn them down, terminate them, um, delete them. 
implement managed services. So if you're in the cloud environment already, you might be aware of the term managed services. But if you're not, typically in the uh, cloud world today, when you say managed services, we're talking about where the cloud provider or your third party provider manage much of the infrastructure security for you so that you have only have to worry about the data and how you're using it. And so what that means is when you're implementing that, um, there's less for you to worry about because your provider is taking care of half or more of the security, leaving you less to worry about and more time to uh, divert to other things, right? Um, and again, automation, and then enable people to perform action at a distance, reducing that human error, and validating software integrity. So ensuring that what you are installing and utilizing is from a trusted resources. So some computers throw a warning sign to you today, right? If you try to download something, it asks you, are you sure this is a source that you trust? This is something from the internet. Are you sure you trust this, right? Making sure you are validating who and what you are downloading. Next, let's talk a little bit about data protection. So we touched on this a little bit earlier about data classification, providing a way for you to categorize the different data you're collecting based on the level of sensitivity and encrypting uh, those data uh, and, and protect them. So some of the questions we want to think about here is how are you classifying that data? And then once you classify them, how do you protect them at rest and how do you protect them in transit? As far as classification goes, this says you want to think about what data do we have? Where is that data? Who technically owns the data? You should have an understanding of the legal and compliance requirement of your workload and what data control needs to be enforced. And you also want to define a data lifecycle management. Is there a retention requirement on the data that you're collecting? Or is there a retention restriction? You can only hold it for so long, right? Being aware of those things and making sure you implement them and delete them um, as necessary. Again, reducing the uh, surface of attack, right? Uh, and then again, automating identification and classification. Are there tools that you can utilize to scan for personal identifiable information? So you know what data you have and it helps you identify and classify the data, the type of data you're collecting so you know what to do with them. For data at rest, you should enforce using encryption for data at rest. Since data that is encrypted cannot be read or accessed without first unencrypting the data, the encryption remain, maintains the confidentiality of your data even in the event of an unauthorized access or accidental disclosure. That is, if you have done a good job of protecting your encryption key, right, where the bad actors can't use the key to unlock the data. So um, key management, making sure you're doing key rotation can help you protect your data at rest. Then we have uh, protecting data in transit, making sure that you are uh, utilizing secure certificate. So have you ever visited a website and then a pops up tells you, this website is not secure. Are you sure you want to proceed? You don't want that to happen to your organization, right? You don't want someone to think that your website is not secure. So making sure that your website is using the transfer layer um, security certificate for your websites. Um, and then that that is up to date. And also whoever you're communicating. So if your website is communicating with other websites or you yourself is communicating with other websites, visiting other websites, ensuring that they have that proper certificate to ensure secure network communication. Lastly, we have incident response. So putting in place the tools and access ahead of a security incident and routinely practicing those incident responses through game days will help you ensure that your architecture can accommodate timely investigation and recovery. So the question I want you to ask yourself here is how are you anticipating response you and recover from an event? So making sure that you're prepared ahead of time, um, identifying the internal experts, personnel, resources, legal applications that you might need in an event um, that something were to happen and practice that. So routinely practice incident response through game days where you may simulate an incident and execute that roadblock, right? So verify that your security personnel have the right tools 
to reduce the time for investigation through uh, to recovery, right? So if you are implementing logs, if you do have a search tool, does your security personnel know how to use that and how to search that so then they can pick out the um, anomaly event real quick to figure out which credential is compromised so that you can delete it real quick, right? Um, and then post-incident, implement a lesson learned framework and culture so that you do a root cause analysis and learn from each event so that you avoid repeating the same mistakes, exposures, or misconfiguration, therefore improving your security posture and minimize time for future situations. So that covers the best practices, guidelines, and security questions that we want you to think about that will protect you against the common threats that we see today. But in the last 20 minutes or so, I want to talk about how AWS security tools help your workflow in the cloud. So if you're uh, evaluating whether AWS is the right tool for you, whether cloud is the right place for you, I want you to be aware of um, what is what we have to offer you and help you. So first is um, we touched on earlier, I talked about managed services, right? And this is kind of the model there. So when you run workload in the cloud, we take care of security of the cloud and you take care of security in the cloud. So what that means um, generally is we take care of the infrastructure that um, the compute resources, the underlying data center, et cetera. And you worry about, and you're responsible for what you put into the cloud. Now, where that line is drawn may look different depending on the managed service or less managed, more or less managed service that you use. So on the far left, you see Amazon EC2, which is Elastic Compute uh, Cloud, which is our virtual server. That is on the less managed side. So we take care of the underlying infrastructure. You take care of everything else on top. But that means you get to have more customization on what you want to do. Versus on the far right, which is Amazon S3 Simple Storage Service, which honestly is where I see a lot of nonprofits start because that's our storage service. We take care of almost everything, right? And you just take care of the data that you're putting into the cloud, uh, making sure that your data the encryption is turned on. We take care of the encryption key for you, but you just need to make sure that the configuration is turned on, making sure you're deleting them as uh, retention your retention uh, requires, right? Or turning on object lock to make sure that no one has access to them. That's your responsibility. So there you have less to manage. Things are a click of a button to you, which makes it easier for you to implement security. So I want to share with you the story of Firmobile, which is a regional public transportation organization in Switzerland. They serve the Swiss capital Bern and its region with trams, buses, and trolley buses. Their residents rely on Burnmobile for over 100 million journeys every year. So they specifically wanted to protect against ransomware because if something were to happen, it could really impede the um, transportation mobility of the city. And so they used AWS to store their backup in the S3 that I just talked about earlier for secure, scalable, and cost-effective storage without the burden of maintenance overhead. And so with AWS and storing that in the cloud, they found that they can automate the backup and, and make that immutable to protect themselves against, against ransomware attacks. Um, and then it also reduced the admin routines for their IT team. So S3 is just one of the many things that we have to help make things easier for you. Here you see a list of AWS services falling under each of the categories that we talked about earlier. So I want to specifically call out two examples. First is Amazon Guard Duty. So Amazon Guard Duty is a threat detection service that is fully managed, which means you just worry about using it. And what it does it is it um, looks at the log data of your entire cloud environment, understands what's going on there, and uses machine learning to um, learn what is normal and what is not, so that it automatically produces you with abnormality anomaly to you, so you can easily sift out the noise um, and just see what is important. Next is AWS Shield, which is our DDoS protection service. 
all of our AWS customers benefit from the automatic protection of AWS Shield standard at no additional charge. And the standard protect you against the networking layer of DDoS attack. So just by running your workload in AWS, you automatically get the DDoS protection for your networking layers through AWS Shield. Um, next, we have Trust Advisor. So Trust Advisor is a tool that scans your environment against some of the best practices that we talked about earlier, but it scans against um, specific uh, resources, right? Which I'll show you in a second. and gives you a list of alerts and resources that are not following best practices. So you know um, what to mitigate and what to fix. So with that, I'm gonna switch the screen share real quick and show you in the console what that looks like. All right, so if you have not used AWS before, this is the homepage of, this is the homepage of AWS, I think I actually closed it, um, homepage of AWS is console. So the first service we're going to go to is Guard Duty, which is the artificial intelligence security service that I talked about just now. So in the home screen of Guard Duty, you'll see it gives me a dashboard on what it is finding by severity and then by finding types. So what I did yesterday to prepare for this um, webinar for this demo is I uh, made my account a little bit insecure to see if I can trigger some findings. So on the left-hand side, if I come to findings, I can see the different findings Guard Duty has say, hey, this is a little bit not normal based on your typical access pattern. One of them is your S3, your storage now has um, anonymous access granted. So anyone who's not authenticated can view it. When I click on that finding, it tells me the severity is high. It tells me exactly which resource it is, when did it happen, the resources that are affected, and more information about this. So that if I want to investigate, I don't have to go sift through the log data. It's already done that for me and I have all of these information that I need to do further investigation. Um, same thing with here. This one is when I leaked my own credential and um, this is the finding that it found. Hey, someone is stealing your credential. This is the resource ID. Here are the resources that were affected. This is the server where it may have leaked from, et cetera. So let's say that your organization has um, storage and pictures that you are sharing with the public, right? This is this is um, normal behavior. It's just a new behavior we're adopting. Um, so guard duty, don't worry about it. Well, you have the capability to suppress findings. So again, right, the suppressing against noises to make sure you're only seeing what's important to you. So you have that capability there. Um, so that's a quick demo of guard duty. Again, the, there's only three findings. Um, I didn't want to make it too insecure and I get in trouble, but on the documentation that we provide, there is a whole list of the different things that guard duty can scan for and we'll alert you to, including malware protection. So remember in the very beginning, we talked about um, bad actors finding vulnerability and installing malware, right? So here you see phishing domain requests, um, Bitcoin, if they get into your server and is using it to mine Bitcoin, um, and other uh, malwares that we see commonly. So the next one I want to talk about is um, Shield. So Shield is the DDoS protection service that you automatically have. So in AWS Shield, um, we provide you with a global threat dashboard. So you see what is going on, what is the common threat and um, attack that we're seeing over the last couple of days, weeks, so that you have an idea what's going on and you are staying up to date. There's also another service I want to mention, which is our web application firewall. Um, so our web application firewall, the reason why I want to mention that is because we partner with a lot of uh, partners and third-party providers on what we call managed rules. So what that is, is a set of web application firewalls rules already made for you. So you don't have to figure out what rules I need to pull in to protect against um, these bad actors. Or if I, if the internet community knows that these IP addresses tend to be less secure, 
um, you don't have to do that work. There are all, all these rules says that you can automatically um, utilize um, to get started with your web application. Last but not least is Trusted Advisor. So if I come back to Trusted Advisor's homepage here, um, again, this is the tool that scans your account against the best practices um, that we talked about just now, but getting down a little more specific. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the different pillars that we had at the beginning. Um, so let's take a look at security. When I come into security, it has some red marks, warning signs. So first is EBS public snapshots. So EBS is our uh, block storage, basically the storage that's attached to your servers. So I have a snapshot of an image of my server that is available to the public. When I click on that, it tells me exactly where that volume is, what that snapshot is, um, the description of that snapshot, which I named it not very secure snapshot. So then I can click on that and go directly investigate, right? Again, saving you time from doing the investigation work because this is all automated for you. And then um, let's take a look at the green check marks, right? So S3 bucket permission. Um, so I have two buckets here. It tells me, it gives me an overview on whether uh, what the, what their status is. There is block public access enabled. So we like that because it prevents um, the public internet from being, being able to access our resources. This one doesn't even have a bucket policy, which means nobody can access it as of right now. So we're good. So you also see what is marked as, um, you know, good to go and things like that. So these are checks that will monitor your AWS environment for you. Every AWS customer gets, um, I think, 56-ish checks for Trusted Advisor, just being an AWS customer. Um, if you do run your organization's workload on AWS and you bring your production workload over and then you start going into more managed, uh, sorry, not managed, you go into more production workloads and you uh, purchase um, developer higher level support, then you get the full check of Trusted Advisor, which is like over 200 or 400, something like that, um, checks that is constantly monitoring your environment. So I wanted to share these tools with you because I stress a lot on automation. Again, there are other tools out there, but I want to share with you how AWS is doing that automation and making it easier for our customers. So with that, um, I want to leave you with some additional resources that you can um, dive further into. So the links here will take you to the Law Architective Framework with all the pillars that you can deep uh, dive deeper on, and then links to the security pillar so you can read about the design principle as well as some of the exercise questions that we touch on today. And this slide, I believe um, Aretha had already sent out, so you have links to these as well. And then Solutions Library and Build Arts Library, that's our pre-made solutions where we pre-build um, a solution for our customers to launch so that they can take advantage of um, the solution without having to build themselves. So feel free to explore that. Uh, last but not least, if you want to learn more about how AWS can help your mission, can help your security, or just have questions about AWS in general, feel free to email us at the address you see on the screen here. And you can also fill out a contact form by scanning the QR code. But also, um, as a way to help you get started, I want to invite Mike, uh, my colleague, to talk about the credit program that we have um, with TechSoup. Mike? Hey, Angela, thanks so much for that. Really helpful uh, and impactful information. Uh, hi, everyone, I'm Mike Yoon. Um, I'm a pro nonprofit program manager here at AWS. Um, so outside of kind of topic focus based webinars like the one that you just heard from Angela, you know, AWS offers a multiple multitude of, of, of other ways for your nonprofit to really engage with us. So we offer programs that are focused on your organizations, uh, such as like understanding where your organization is in this kind of like cloud journey. Uh, we provide a free resource called the Power and Purpose Guide. Uh, we also have funding opportunities. You might have heard something like called the Imagine Grant. Uh, we're coming to, coming to the end of our 2024 cohort. We'll be uh, announcing 2024 
uh, winners here in a, in a few weeks. And we also have Imagine Conference coming up in, in early 2025. It's a, it's a free conference that are open to nonprofits uh, where you can hear from nonprofits just as yourselves, hear about like the common challenges and things like that that um, um, other organizations are going through. Uh, and of course, as, as, as Angela had mentioned, uh, if you visit TechSoup, um, if you are new to AWS, we, we actually work directly with TechSoup to provide nonprofit organizations uh, with funding to support your AWS cloud usage. So this program provides nonprofits like yours with credits up to $5,000 annually to help you in your cloud journey. And again, you can learn more at uh, the TechSoup website. Um, so as Angela had said, you can click on this QR code here to, uh, to connect with us directly or email us uh, at this email address provided here. Um, you know, with that, um, you know, I'd like once again, just to thank Angela um, and TechSoup. Um, thank you, Angela, for walking us through this really important topic. And uh, thank you for to all of you who, uh, who took the time to join us today. Again, I'm Mike Yoon. We appreciate your interest in AWS and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.